So uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to our friends around the world. My name is Kevin Welding. Uh, I'm the Associate Director of the Institute for Global Tobacco Control at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. So thanks for joining us for our latest talk in the Innovations in Tobacco Control Lecture Series. I'm very excited to introduce our speaker for today, um, Dr. Yvette van der Eyck. Uh, Yvette is an assistant professor in the Saw Sui Hock School of Public Health at the National University of Singapore, where she had uh, she was previously a senior research fellow. Um, so her academic journey actually started in life sciences, uh, and then she headed towards public health. Um, her PhD thesis at the U National University of Singapore focused on an ethical framework for tobacco control policy. She completed a postdoctoral fellowship in tobacco control at the University of California, San Francisco, and worked as a consultant for the WHO. Um, recently, her research focused on supporting tobacco control initiatives in Singapore by exploring marketing and social environments, the use of flavored cigarettes, and the tobacco industry strategies to encourage smoking. Um, she's had a slew of papers published in the last couple of years. She's been very productive. These have looked at tobacco industry tactics, raising the minimum legal age to purchase tobacco, e-cigarette markets and policies, plain packaging, and what she'll talk about today. The tobacco industry strategies for flavor, flavor capsule cigarettes, evidence from patents and internal documents. So um, if you guys have questions, you can, you can put them in the Q&A box along the way. Um, but for now, I'll hand it over to, to Yvette. Thanks. Thank you, Kevin. And thanks for the introduction. And also, thanks so much for having me here. Um, and also, thanks to everyone for coming. I know that the time difference makes it tricky sometimes and that the US East Coasters had to be up at 8 a.m. So I do appreciate it. Uh, so let me just share my screen so you can see my slides. And then we'll get started. All right. So hopefully, you should be able to see this. OK. So yeah, um, yeah, okay. So for today's talk, I'm going to be talking about uh, some of the tobacco industry's internal strategies related to flavor capsule cigarettes. Um, so this is from a research study that we did over the last couple of years, uh, where we were looking at industry patents and internal tobacco industry documents. So before I get started, I'd just like to give a big shout out, a big thank you to uh, my co-authors of this study, Ken, Grace, and Wee Meng. Um, who, you know, tirelessly dug through these patents and internal documents and also helped uh, publish this study. So uh, first off, so what are flavor capsule cigarettes, right? So in short, these are cigarettes with a crushable flavor capsule inside of the filter. So uh, here are some pictures of flavor capsule cigarettes that we found on the Singapore market. Uh, in the last few years. This was before plain packaging. So as you can see from this one on the right, for example, um, so the, they usually have a, a little flavor capsule in the filter, like a little ball, which when, when the person crushes it, it releases a flavor into the cigarette. So it's like an on-demand flavor, right? And there are many, many different types of flavor capsule cigarettes on the market now. This is, uh, this is a kind of category cigarettes that's becoming increasingly diversified. Um, so what we see, for instance, is you've got some capsule cigarettes uh, that transform a regular non-flavored cigarette to a menthol cigarette. So for instance, it's where the tobacco itself is not flavored, but the capsule is flavored often with menthol or mint, so that when the user crushes it, it transforms a regular non-flavored cigarette into a flavored menthol cigarette. And they are often marketed with, with names like Switch. And then you've got capsule cigarettes whereby it's already a menthol flavored cigarette, but the capsule, uh, when you burst it, adds an extra flavor to the cigarette. So for example, an extra menthol flavor, like what we see here with Mega Ice Blast. So this is a menthol cigarette with extra menthol capsule flavor. Or in some cases, it's a menthol cigarette where the capsule adds another flavor, like a fruit, for example. So that's what we see, for example, with this one here, Marlboro Splash Mara Purple, which is a, a grape, capsule on a menthol cigarette. And then on top of that, we also see some capsule cigarettes with multiple capsules, like the one here. This has two different types of mint flavor capsule. Um, and we also see a kind of pick and mix concept, like the one here, Lucky Strike Click for Mix. So here, this is where, where you see there are four different types of flavors which are put together and mixed inside of the pack. 
And when we first came across this on the Singapore market, uh, it actually reminded me of, you know, when I used to walk to school as a preteen and we used to get the pick and mix sweet packs. So it reminds me a bit of that kind of concept. And also one notable thing that we found about the flavor capsule cigarettes um, is that they, they're packaged in very similar ways. So at least before plain packaging, the design for these cigarettes is often, you know, like bright metallic or neon colors on a dark background. Um, a bit like strobe lighting in discos, you know, something like this, like a clubby kind of youthful vibe to the packaging. This is something that we see with almost all capsule variants. So the reason why uh, attention has been paid to these flavor capsule cigarettes in the last few years is because the market for them has grown very rapidly. Uh, so these cigarettes, these capsule cigarettes were only launched in 2007. So the first one was launched in Japan and then the second one in US in 2008. And what we see is a very rapid growth in their market share in just the space of 10 years. So this chart actually shows the market share percentage of flavor capsule cigarettes in uh, between 2003 and 2017. So what you can see is in a number of countries, their share has grown to around a third, which is very fast and very large market share. So especially in countries like Chile, Peru and Guatemala, um, capsule cigarettes take around a third of the cigarette market. Uh, and it's also quite high, oops, sorry in other countries uh, outside of Latin America, like South Korea and the United Kingdom, for, for example. And in many other countries, like for example, Singapore, one being, uh, Singapore being one of them, uh, we see that the market share isn't so huge yet, maybe around 5%, but it's been growing very quickly in the last few years. So it's a real concern mainly because of that. And actually out of all of the um, combustible uh, tobacco products, capsule cigarettes are the fastest growing segment currently. And what we've also seen in, in countries that have implemented other tobacco regulations, uh, namely plain packaging and taxes, is that tobacco companies seem to be using these flavor capsule cigarettes to undermine these regulations. So, for instance, in countries like Singapore and Australia, when they implemented plain packaging, one thing that we saw is, uh, is following plain packaging, there was, a, there was more release of these flavor capsule variants. And that's because if tobacco companies can no longer market they're, you know, the, if they can no longer use the packaging as, as a marketing medium, then they have to resort to other available means, and often that is the product itself. So they seem to be investing more of their designs and the appeal in the actual product with flavors and these kind of capsule designs. And also what we see in some countries that have uh, hiked up tobacco taxes is more of an influx of flavor capsule variants, especially in the value brands. So for instance, there was a study in Mexico where they found that um, after their tax increases, uh, brands like Paul Mall, which are known as value brands, um, they had more flavor capsule variants within those brands because the tobacco companies wanted to premiumize these brands so that your younger consumers who are using perhaps more expensive flavor capsule cigarettes will then switch to Paul Mall instead of quitting cigarettes. And perhaps the biggest concern of all is that these flavor capsule cigarettes seem to appeal mostly to young people. So there have been various studies in different countries on this, uh, mostly in the form of qualitative studies um, and also surveys. And what they consistently find is that the, the people that are using flavor capsule cigarettes tend to be younger, they're, they're more likely to be female. Um, and also they, they tend to appeal quite a lot to young people. And young people tend to be drawn to these flavor capsule cigarettes mainly because of the interesting flavors available uh, because of the novelty, you know, because they're able to customize, personalize their smoking experience. And also for younger social smokers, flavor capsule cigarettes, because it allows you to create different flavor combinations with one cigarette, uh, it makes it easier for them to say, share one pack of cigarettes between friends. And these are for like young people who are maybe just starting out smoking. So this is a real concern on different levels. Um, and up to this point, uh, there wasn't much known actually on the tobacco industry's internal strategies uh, regarding flavor capsule cigarettes. I mean, we do have strong evidence that it's appealing to young people, but what we wanted to find out more was, okay, so for the tobacco companies, they're obviously investing very heavily in these flavor capsule variants. So uh, who, is it, who is it that they're targeting in their marketing and why? And you know, with it being such a, a, a category of products that's very heavily focused on technological innovation, uh, what has the tobacco industry been looking into and what may they look into in the future?
So that brings us to the aim of the study, which was to describe the tobacco industry strategies for flavor capsule cigarettes from the industry's perspective. So the way that we did this, uh, we had two main sources for our data. One was the industry patents, and the other was the internal tobacco industry documents from the Truth Tobacco Industry Documents Library. So uh, first of all, the patents. Uh, so we, 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 we did a systematic search for patents in an international patents database called PatSnap. So this works similar to a Google search engine. So you just type in standard keywords, uh, like a search string, and then it returns hits related to that. Um, and actually, the reason why we wanted to look at patents is because uh, patents are quite a, a rich source of technical data. Um, and especially if you're looking at patents, which were filed quite recently, uh, say in the last five to 10 years, you can get pretty interesting information on new products that the tobacco companies are likely to market in the future. Because obviously for the tobacco companies to really gain in the market from these products, they would have to patent the design, right? So it's, it gives us a good preview of what industries or the tobacco industry might launch in the near future, say to get around regulations or to make their cigarettes more appealing. <clears throat> so our initial search in PatSnap yielded 580 patents that somehow mentioned the term flavor capsule and cigarette. Then we also concurrently did a search in the industry documents library. So um, this is, a, this is a, a set of internal tobacco industry documents that have been released through lawsuits against the tobacco industry. Uh, and currently this database holds over 40 million internal documents, uh, which is things like marketing reports, scientific research reports, and so forth. Um, so these contrast to patents in that they tend to give more of a historical perspective, you know, so it tends to give us an idea of, okay, so <clears throat> related to these capsule cigarettes, what were the tobacco companies researching? Who were they targeting in their marketing strategies? What was their specific marketing strategies? What was their product development strategies like historically? So it's, it's like, you know, putting the past with the future almost, these contrasting the documents and this patents database. So again, this also works similar way to a Google search engine. So we just did a general snowball search. We started with the term crushable capsule, which um, based on preliminary searches seems to be the most uh, common industry term for these capsule cigarettes. And this yielded initial uh, 465 hits initially. And then uh, we did very extensive follow-up searches in this industry documents library. So follow-up searches were based on adjacent documents, um, based on what we found in the industry, in our initial search, we looked for project code names um, and any kind of industry terminology that was related to capsule cigarettes. Um, and we also did follow-up searches based on patents that we found. So certain technological features that we came across in the patents, we would do follow-up searches in the documents and also vice versa, any kind of um, industry developments that we that we found related to capsule cigarettes. Um, if we hadn't already found patents for it, we did follow-up searches in PatSnap. So in the end, we ended up with 65 unique patents. So this was around 155 when you count the duplicate ones as well, but the unique patents was around 65 and 179 internal industry documents. So then we put them all together uh, in an inductive coding process. So what that meant is we searched for codes um, that arose from our data. And our findings, so our industry documents uh, were mainly from 1967 to 2009. Um, and the patents that we retrieved were from 1965 to 2017. So fairly similar time range for both. But actually most of our patents, vast majority were from the 2000s and 2010s. And if you recall the chart that I showed you earlier, uh, this is also around the time that the tobacco industry's investment in these flavor capsule cigarettes really intensified. So broadly speaking, I mean, I'll go into more detail um, in a bit, but broadly speaking, the four main themes that we, um, that we got was first of all, novelty. So we got quite a few patents and industry documents that were describing capsule cigarettes that were intended as a novelty appeal. So, you know, when mainly like with novelty features, like different types of capsules and different, different interesting features that they could incorporate into different capsule cigarettes in order to increase the appeal of these variants. 
Um, second, we came across um, patents and documents that, that were more of designed for harm reduction purposes or to at least give the impression of a harm reduction appeal. Um, so these were, for instance, uh, cigarettes that were designed to remove certain smoke constituents uh, that also contain flavor capsules or the industry's internal toxicology tests of flavor capsule variants. Third, we found uh, different designs related uh, that, that were more targeted to optimize the designs of flavor capsules that they had developed. So for instance, uh, trying to optimize the flavor dispersion, things like that. And finally, we also found a number of patents and documents uh, for uh, product developments that were actually not, not strictly cigarettes, but these were kind of like loose units. So something that can be sold separately, but that contains a flavor capsule that is then designed to be incorporated into a cigarette or a cigarette pack. So the very first flavor capsule cigarettes uh, were developed in 1960s. So American Tobacco Company launched the first flavor capsule cigarette in 1967, and they called it the convertible menthol. And they, they released a couple more after that. One of them was called the Brighton Convertible. So you can see here, this is an early ad for the Brighton Convertible. So as you can see, uh, the cigarette, the way this was designed is it had, um, it had basically a set of micro capsules inside of the filter. So these are a bit like today's modern capsule, except they're smaller and there's maybe a few of them. And then uh, the idea was that you would squeeze the filter and it would release the menthol into the cigarette. So they were marketing them as the convertible cigarette or the convertible menthol. So there were some efforts in the 60s, but they didn't seem like they gained much traction in the market. Then in the early 80s, there seems to be, have been a bit of a revival for this concept, mainly by Philip Morris. So Philip Morris was marketing what they call the dial menthol concept. So this was very similar to American Tobacco Company's uh, menthol convertible, um, except that instead of just you know, squeezing it once and it releasing menthol into the cigarette once, the idea was that you could adjust the amount of menthol that it released. So for example, if you squeezed it or twisted it just a little bit, it would release just a little amount. Whereas if you twisted it a lot, you could release the maximum amount. And there were also some patents filed around this time in the early 1980s for such designs. So here at the bottom here, you can see this patent. Uh, so you see this is like a row of um, micro capsules holding menthol flavor. And then the idea is that you twist the cigarette and then it releases a variable amount of menthol into the cigarette. And then this is a similar design. Uh, filed a few years later, um, except for with this one, the, the, the filter is actually designed to be rotated, twisted completely. And with the more you rotate it, the more menthol it releases. Now for both of these, um, both in the 60s and in the 80s, uh, there seems to have been li limited success with these variants in the market. Uh, so Philip Morris's dial of menthol concept, they did launch it, but it didn't really do very well and it didn't really gain much traction. And actually what we find is that really there was very little traction in the market uh, with these capsule cigarettes until we get to around the early 2000s. Um, so up until then, uh, the main development that was going on there was RJ Reynolds's development of Camel Crush, which was actually the first capsule cigarette, flavor capsule cigarette to be launched on the US market. Um, so, so for this one, uh, R.J. Reynolds had actually been uh, researching this since the 1980s, but it was mostly conceptual research. So they had been researching different flavors they could use in the capsule cigarettes and different concepts with which they could market them. So they were, for example, exploring this concept whereby maybe couples could share the same cigarette, um, you know, because then you can customize the flavor depending on the preferences. Or they had different cigarettes like flavor on demand or novelty. So they were experimenting with these, uh, but it seems like perhaps they were waiting for a market opportunity, which came in the 2000s uh, in the form of the millennial generation. So in around the 2000s, we found quite a lot of marketing documents, uh, which were exploring the target for these capsule cigarettes for Camel Crush, the millennials, uh, which RJ Reynolds ter termed the ASU 30 or adult smokers under 30 but they were actually millennial generation. And at that time, uh, they would have been in their teens and early twenties. 
So R.J. Reynolds did quite a lot of detailed research on the millennial consumer. So as you can see here in the picture, they had psychographic profiles of typical um, camel smokers or camel crush smokers. Um, so here's Meet Pete and Jenny. Um, and then the, they had very detailed profiles of the, the millennial consumers. And also they had quite a lot of information on, you know, why these capsule cigarettes might appeal to these millennial consumers. So one, one trait that they highlighted was that the millennial consumers, they were a generation that liked to be in control of things, right? So they like to be in control of their life, of their media. So this is obviously evident in the social media trend and also of their brands. So that's why they believe that flavor capsule cigarettes would appeal to these millennials because, um, you know, you could, because these capsule cigarettes allow you to actually personalize the smoking experience and it's an on-demand flavor. So they, they, they believe that this would appeal to them quite a lot. Um, whoops. And then also, um, you know, they, they knew that they, that they were quite a diverse generation, quite ethnically diverse, well connected to social media, quite technologically savvy. So that was another way in which they believed that capsule cigarettes would appeal to them because it's a kind of new tech feature, right? Um, and also they knew that the millennial generation, they wanted authentic brand experiences and they wanted something that they could share with others. So those were the main target. And the secondary target for R.J. Reynolds was the Hispanic uh, young people in the U.S. Uh, and this was mainly because, uh, I mean, they fitted the profile of their main target, but also because this was a, a group of people that was not really being targeted heavily by their competitors, particularly Philip Mars. So they saw this was a viable sub-target. So in, in preparation of the 2008 launch of Camel Crutch, um, RJ Reynolds uh, put together a marketing campaign that they believed would appeal a lot to the millennials. So this marketing campaign was focused very heavily on this idea that Camel Crush or these capsule cigarettes were a novelty um, and that they allowed them to control their smoking experience. And they also try to echo that in their marketing strategy. So actually co-creation was quite a heavy theme because they believe that, okay, you know, they, they want to be involved in the conceptualization of the marketing campaign. So they actually um, had a few thousand millennial co-creators for this marketing campaign. Um, and then they, they marketed it using, you know, very clubby kind of modern advertising themes uh, that also emphasize the technological appeal of these cigarettes, you know, this new design feature, if you like. Um, and it's hard to see from the colors because this is a black and white ad but in many of the marketing adverts uh, for Camel Crush, you know, they use these kind of modern clubby kind of colors. So neon colors on a black background, much like the packs I showed you at the beginning. Um, and they also marketed them using events that they believed would be frequented by these young people. So they had these beast houses, which was like uh, sponsored events to, to market the Camel Crush. And here you've got Unleash the Beast. So these are adverts, which are actually in Spanish. Um, es tu momento gozalo, so it's something along the lines of it's your it's your time enjoy, yeah. So this was to target the Hispanic market, uh, and also to um, they did they run test markets in Puerto Rico, um, you know, to target the Hispanics, and much of their marketing was using a seed and spread approach. So essentially, advertising through word of mouth. So the way that they did this initially was engaging with the retailers. Um, who would then, you know, promote the product through word of mouth and also engaging influential millennials who would then, you know, advertise it on their social media or through their personal networks or whatever, and then it would kind of spread from there. So documents, um, documents that we found from within the year after the launch, um, they all spoke about the launch of Camel Crush in US as having been a very a resounding success. So this particular document is from 2009. So this was one year after Camel Crush was launched in the US and they're analyzing the, the outcome of the launch. And here they say, we are very enthusiastic about the results we have to date. So this is RJ Reynolds, by the way. Um, so they're describing that they had uh, gone national with Camel Crush in September and they had achieved 0.4% share of market in the first month with no price promotion, which was virtually unheard of today in cigarettes. So yeah, so their, their launch has been very successful. And you know, what we see now since the launch is that the marketing themes that they're using for capsule cigarettes are still quite similar to the marketing themes that they used in the initial launch and also the packs that I showed you. So as I mentioned, you know, dark clubby colors, the kind of designs that would appeal 
to the younger generation. So uh, we also found patents uh, from early 2010s uh, for transparent filters or transparent cutout holes in the filter. So these were designed mainly so that you could visualize the release of, um, of when you break the capsule. So you could visualize the release of flavors into the cigarette. So some of these patents were for a filter that would be completely transparent. Others were for regular filters, but with cutout holes like what you see here to help visualize the release. Yeah, so that was another novelty feature that we saw. Um, however, even though we saw patents for this, uh, we did not find any internal documents and we could not find any evidence of them having been launched, but it's possible that they may be launched in the future. If there is, you know, for example, a demand for this kind of product. Um, then to the second theme, which was on harm reduction. So uh, we found several industry documents and patents for, for cigarettes, capsule cigarettes, that were designed to remove uh, certain smoke constituents. So this is somewhat similar to some of the earlier patents that we saw, and, and they were mainly for water capsule cigarettes. So these were mainly being developed um, by tobacco companies in the 60s and early 70s. So their thinking was that if they included a water capsule in the cigarettes, that water capsule would remove some of the smoke constituents. Um, and some of these designs also contained a flavor capsule like menthol in order to offset some of the loss of flavor. Um, now there's no evidence of um, a water and flavor capsule cigarettes having gone to market, although some tobacco companies did release water capsule cigarettes, uh, but they were not flavored and they didn't really seem to gain much traction in the markets. Then in the 90s to 2013, so 1999 to 2013, we found quite a few industry documents describing uh, Philip Morris's SCORE-G program, and SCORE-G stands for Smoke Constituent Reduction. So around this time, Philip Morris seems to have been trying to develop a cigarette uh, with activated carbon in the filter, um, and also with menthol capsule, which could, in their eyes, maybe um, reduce some of the smoke constituents. So the early design for SCORE-G looks something like this. So it's essentially a segmented cigarette, which um, has different parts within the filter. So part of it here would be like an activated carbon material, which also contains some flavor capsule cigarettes. Here they had like a flavored thread to offset some of the flavor loss. Yeah. So the idea was uh, for Philip Morris, much of their product development idea, and, and based on you know, the, the early consumer tests that we came across, um, it seems that they were testing this mainly on young people, people in their 20s and 30s. Uh, they believe that this would have appeal among younger people uh, who are mainly health conscious, um, you know, to maybe discourage them from quitting. Um, and you know, they were close, it seems, to maybe uh, bring this to market, but then it appears that they had some product quality issues. And so they pretty much shelved the SCORE-G program. So we don't see any evidence really of this having been launched. Uh, although we did come across quite a few patents from 2000s and 2010s, uh, patenting designs that were similar to SCORE-G. So perhaps it's possible that we're still developing SCORE-G in the 2010s. Then on the note of um, harm reduction, we also came across some documents where um, two of the tobacco companies, RJ Reynolds and Philip Morris, had been doing toxicology tests on some of their flavor capsule variants. Um, so RJ Reynolds did two sets of toxicology tests. So in all the cases, these toxicology tests were generally where they would have a flavor capsule cigarette and they would, con they would and then the control would be the same cigarette, but without the flavor capsule included. So the 2000 tests, uh, RJ Reynolds was comparing flavor capsule cigarette to the same without the capsule in it. And they actually found presence of glutaraldehyde carcinogen in the flavor capsule variant. Um, but despite this, RJ Reynolds went ahead um, with its plan to include this flavor capsule cigarette in its Dippo brand. Then two years later, in 2002, RJ Reynolds, uh, again, did tests on another flavor capsule variant uh, versus a control. And what they found was in the flavor capsule variant, uh, the total particulate matter, tar and nicotine levels were around five to 10% higher in the capsules variant. Uh, but then RJ Reynolds went ahead and approved this capsule cigarette for consumer testing anyway. 
Then in 2005, uh, Philip Morris was doing smoke chemistry tests on its Score G cigarette, which is, if you recall, was a flavor capsule cigarette with uh, activated carbon filter. And what they found was that Score G compared to the control, which did not have the capsule in it, uh, had a statistically significant increase in nine carcinogens. And it does, it's unclear whether, you know, this was behind part of the reason why it was shelved. Oh yeah, and another note I would like to, just on that note, uh, it's also interesting that you know in the literature uh, there have also been some published studies of toxicology tests for flavor capsules. Or what they did is they they test you know before and after crushing um, a menthol capsule in a flavor capsule cigarette whether that increases you know the presence of different carcinogens or different toxicants. And there have been three studies in that regard. So two were independent of the tobacco industry and one was industry funded. Now the industry funded study found that it made no difference whether you crush the capsule or not. Whereas the two industry independent studies actually found that it increases the toxic, you know, increases the toxicant profile and the carcinogen profile. So it's interesting to see that the industry's internal toxicology tests, which were not published, were quite similar to the um, industry independent studies that have been published. Anywho, so, um, and we also found uh, several cigarette designs, um, patents mainly, um, of cigarettes that had different airflow manipulation features. So by that, it's, uh, there are two different types essentially, but the basic principle was that um, users could manipulate the airflow going into the cigarette uh, such that it increases the strength of the smoke and also the strength of the flavor delivered to them. And there were two basic ways in which uh, designs aim to achieve this. So one was by incorporating ventilation holes in the filter. So this is something like what you see here in this design. So this is a patent for a cigarette, which um, you can actually twist the filter. And when you twist it, you either uncover or cover up a ventilation hole. Yeah, so that, um, you know, that, that, that kind of allows the user to vary the strength of the smoke. And this particular design that we came across had a flavor capsule in it so that, you know, if it's crushed um, and the ventilation holes are exposed, that it would actually increase the flavor delivery as well. And then uh, th there were some designs where it was like twisting like this. And then there were other designs where it was simply just ventilation holes that the user has to cover up with their fingertips. Then we saw others which, uh, which work by having an obstacle inside of the filter. So a bit like this one you see here on the left. So the way this works is, so you would have, for example, a flavor capsule. So this is like a regular flavor capsule, which when you crush it releases flavor into the cigarette. But then it also has an obstacle, which is a capsule that is not flavored. So it really just acts as an obstacle to block the airflow so that, but then when you crush this obstacle capsule, um, it's, um, it allows the air to flow through, so then it increases the strength of the smoke and also the flavor delivery. And we found various patents from different tobacco companies that had different designs for this. So in some cases, this was a, a large capsule. In other cases, it was like some kind of rod or some other structure, which essentially acts as an obstacle to block the airflow. Um, so we actually did not find any evidence of any of these designs being launched, at least with a flavor capsule. Um, we didn't find anything in the industry documents either, possibly because, you know, these patents were filed somewhat later. The nearest design that we did see on the market was the LNMU spin. So in this particular cigarette, um, it's, it's very similar to this design here. So the LMU spin, you actually twist the filter and the more you twist it, um, the stronger the smoke that is delivered because I guess it, it, you know, it varies the amount of ventilation that goes in the cigarette. Uh, but the LMU spin does not actually contain a flavor capsule similar to the designs that we came across. Then um, over the decades, we, we found some patents and also some documents where the tobacco companies were essentially trying to optimize the different technologies for flavor capsule cigarettes. So we see some designs where they were trying to use heat to release the flavor because, you know, in most of the designs that we've covered so far, the user has to do it manually, right? So they have to crush the filter or they have to twist it or do something. So they were looking into designs where you could use heat to release the flavor. So the top is a good example of that. So this is essentially a cigarette where here you have the tobacco rod and in the center, they've actually created a sort of 
um, tunnel, right? And then what happens is the heat from the cigarette from the lid end travels through here. And then, um, you know, it ends up here. And then here, it's not shown here, but they, they were planning on putting a flavor capsule, which once it, it, it receives heat from here, then a flavor capsule bursts and releases the flavor into the cigarette. So there were different designs, whether we're using heat uh, for flavor release. We also see some designs where they were trying to improve the flavor dispersion, uh, mainly to prevent flavor from leaking out onto the side or leaking out into the tips onto the person's fingers. So for instance, we see here a, um, a truncated cone-shaped capsule, which is different to the usual round shape, um, so that the flavor would then be encouraged to go into this way, away from the person's uh, fingertips. And then we also see various technologies where they were trying to make the capsule easier to burst. So for instance, uh, use of different capsule shapes. Although we haven't really seen any of those in the market, the ones that we've seen in cigarettes mainly are the spheric shape like this one. And then interestingly, uh, one finding that I thought was actually quite interesting and also relevant uh, in places that are starting to ban flavored cigarettes is uh, we found patents um, and also some industry documents describing loose flavor capsule units. And these are three different tobacco companies, at least that appear to have been working on this. So these are essentially for separate units um, that contain some kind of flavor capsule, which can then be incorporated somehow into a cigarette or into a cigarette pack to give it flavor, or then transform it essentially into a flavored uh, capsule cigarette. So these are the ones described by Philip Morris. So in 1999, um, Philip Morris was developing some kind of unit to minimize flavor loss. And according to the patents, it looked a little bit like this. So it's essentially, it's a kind of um, structure that holds a flavor capsule right here. And then it would be inserted like here into a recessed cigarette filter. So here you see the end of the, the filtered cigarette. Yeah, so the idea was, I mean, the industry documents that we found suggest that it was to minimize flavor loss in the cigarette, but it could have had other applications like just simply being able to customize the cigarette. Then, um, then in the 2016, um, Philip Morris actually painted, patented a cartridge cigarette, which looks a little bit like this. So this is an image taken from the patent. So here, this is on the left, this is essentially um, a cigarette filter here with a sort of empty cylinder, right? And then what happens is you, you get the tobacco rod separately and then insert it inside of the cylinder. So this allows users to mix and match filters with the tobacco rod. And according to the patent, um, these filters could also include flavor capsules. So it essentially allows users to buy tobacco rods separately from the filters and then mix and match the flavor combinations to however they wish. RJ Reynolds also had its own development. Um, so RJ Reynolds, uh, we found some industry documents from around 2000, where RJ Reynolds was exploring fragrance pellets. Um, so these were essentially micro capsules, so smaller than the traditional crushable capsules which could be coated onto cigarette packs to give them some kind of fragrance or coated on the inside of the pack to infuse the cigarettes. Um, or that, for instance, could be coated onto cigarette filters so that it could, you know, sense the, the fingertips of the smoker to reduce things like the bad breath or the, the, the smell on the fingertips. So they were exploring that concept in 2000. Then about a decade later, um, RJ Reynolds patented uh, what it called the flavor additive accessory. So this flavor additive accessory uh, was actually a very diverse kind of product. Um, and here, this is just an image from the patent so I can help describe exactly what was going on. So essentially this flavor additive accessory, the way it was designed was that you could have flavor capsules, much like the one here, uh, which could be put into a kind of pill sheet format, like what you see here. So essentially here you have like, maybe this is this here is the flavor capsule, and then you can uh, put it into this form. So you can essentially place it inside of the cigarette pack, like so. And then the idea was that it could, oops, sorry, was that it could infuse the cigarette pack with a scent or a flavor, like for example, a mint scent, yeah. But then you could also, for example, snap it off and then maybe incorporate one of these capsules 
into the cigarette directly, like what's done here. So this, for example, would fit into a recessed cigarette filter right here, transform it effectively into a flavor capsule cigarette. Another, um, another variation of this that's also described in the same patent is where you have these capsule segments uh, shaped like a cigarette stick. And then that cigarette stick, or it's not really a cigarette stick, but it's the shape of a cigarette stick, which could then be put into a cigarette pack like so, and then infuse the cigarettes inside of the pack in the same way as this, what looks like a pill shape right here. And then also these segments could then be broken off and then incorporate it somehow into the cigarette filter, much like here. So either this could be attached to the end of a cigarette filter or whatever's inside could just be snapped out and then put into a recessed filter. So the way that this patent is described, it allows them to really get around quite a lot of different regulations if you think about it, because it allows them to sell separate units that you can then attach to a cigarette or put inside of a cigarette or whatever. And another thing that I found very striking, especially about this particular patent, was it described a huge range of flavors and additives uh, that could be put inside of these um, accessories, right? So when we talk flavors, I mean, yeah, you've got your standard ones that you see on the market, like menthol, mint, uh, fruit flavors. But there was also a lot of synthetic compounds that actually could mimic flavors or act as a kind of flavors. Um, it also describes additives of any kind, um, including tobacco extracts, which if you think about it, if they're adding tobacco extract or even nicotine extract into these, it could actually boost the nicotine hit of certain cigarettes. So it allows for a very wide uh, range and it really allows them to customize cigarettes in many ways. And finally, BAT was also developing these loose flavor capsule units. Um, so the main patent that we see from BAT is this one right here, filed in 2012. So this was um, a unit that was designed to slot into a recessed filter. And there were two forms broadly described. So one is something like this, kind of like a cartridge almost, holding a flavor capsule right here which would then slot um, very neatly into the recessed filter cavity, just like this. And the other one that they described was essentially a large flat capsule, which would then slot into the cavity in the same way. And then you would crush this one directly. And what I thought would be interesting to highlight at this point is also that uh, recessed filters are already out there in the market. Um, I mean, at least in the Singapore market, uh, you know, we've been doing quite detailed analysis of all the different cigarette packs and cigarette products. And uh, at least two of the brands already are selling uh, with recessed filters. So this is the one from Marlboro, as you can see here, it has like a cavity right here. And Dunhill, which is one of BAT's brands, also has a recessed filter, as you can see right here. So it's possible that the tobacco companies have already started priming the market uh, for these kind of accessories. So, I mean, th this has various policy implications. I mean, it's, it's pretty clear from our documents that we saw, especially on Camel Crush and RJR's uh, marketing strategy is that the main target was young people, right? I mean, it was millennials who were in their teens and early twenties at the time when Camel Crush was launched. So, and I mean, this together with all of the evidence of their appeal among the young people uh, is pretty clear case, you know? I mean, if we want to protect young people from cigarettes, we really need to protect them from flavor capsule cigarettes because they are one way in which tobacco companies still increase the appeal of cigarettes. And uh, it's not just the flavors, right? It's also the design and the different features and that novelty aspect that I think is very important to highlight here. So I really do think that, you know, it's time to maybe start thinking about, you know, what's after plain packaging, right? I mean, when you look at countries like, for example, Singapore, Australia, where tobacco advertising is very strictly regulated, plain packaging has been implemented. The main way in which tobacco companies continue to market and increase the appeal of cigarettes is with the stick itself. So really we should be moving towards plain cigarettes. Um, and also I think what this highlights and also especially from the patents is that it's quite essential to keep up with the evolution of new designs of these flavor capsules, uh, whether it be flavor capsule cigarettes itself or accessories that are designed to be incorporated somehow um, into cigarettes or tobacco products. 
Um, and I think what one thing that that you know we, we found, um, especially in the patents, what that is that there are a huge diverse range of designs out there. I mean, the capsule itself, I mean, even though the capsules that we've seen on the market so far are just like a single crushable capsule, which is probably about a few millimeters wide. Uh, we've been seeing cigarettes with multiple capsules. We've seen micro capsules, a lot of patents filed for those, which you know are much smaller um, and maybe put onto uh, you know surfaces like cigarette filter surfaces or cigarette pack surfaces as a kind of micro capsule layer. So there's a lot of diverse kind of ways in which the tobacco companies have been looking to incorporate flavor capsules into their product. And also, as I mentioned, you know, different systems for flavor release. So it could be manual, something adjustable, something heat triggered. There are many different technologies tobacco companies were looking into. And then added features like, you know, airflow manipulation, transparent filters. And then of course, the wide range of loose units that can be incorporated into cigarettes. So, you know, in terms of policy, what that means is it's quite important to, to, to think ahead with all these things uh, so that we can preempt this uh, so that tobacco companies can't get around them and say, you know, you ban flavored cigarettes. And also, I think it's important to pay attention to the diverse range of flavors and additives uh, that have been described in the documents and also patented as well. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, it goes beyond just the basic flavors. And, you know, there's also we've seen tobacco extract, which, you know, when you look at, um, you know, I mean, I know there are some initiatives. I mean, New Zealand having recently announced uh, that it's going to lower the nicotine content in cigarettes. And I know that this has been discussed a lot in the US as well. Um, so, you know, this is one way in which tobacco companies may try and get around it, you know, is by having some. Uh, some way of incorporating nicotine or tobacco into cigarettes and to increase that nicotine hit. So this is something that needs to be looked at in these legislations. And also uh, in regards to compounds that are not flavor strictly, but that may mimic flavors, uh, that's also a potential issue. And I know in some markets uh, that's already become problematic. Like for instance, in the UK, um, I read somewhere that you know after they banned uh, menthol, they were actually seeing some variants that had some kind of additive or compound that was supposed to mimic menthol flavor. So, I mean, you know, these kind of regulations need to be very comprehensive and recognize the diversity and evolution of new designs as well. So to conclude, uh, tobacco companies have developed a broad range of flavor capsule designs to target youth and possibly, likely, to undermine regulations, uh, particularly flavor bans and plain packaging. All right, so that's all I have. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Um, so I'm going to stop my screen share now so that I can see the chat. Perfect, and, I and I'll help. I'll help you through the the questions that we have. And I, I have some. I have plenty of questions my, myself. We have one question so far. If people want to use the Q and A box at the bottom to ask other questions, feel free. We we have about ten minutes. Um, I mean, I'll say a few things like first, the whenever we look at industry documents, they sort of just reveal themselves like the, to the toxicology test that you showed, right? The Like a, a clear evidence that the tobacco industry probably shouldn't be self-regulating themselves, right? And so every, every time you look at the industry documents, you just find stuff like this of them trying to produce their own science and sometimes ignoring their own results. Um, I'll also say, you know, we have our tea packs collection and we have about like over 6,600 packs. And I'm pretty sure like it's a lot of packs that I have to recall over the last uh, five or so years. I, I think we have seen possibly some transparent filters that I now I'm like, I have to go find them and share them with you. I think we might have seen one. Um, yeah, and some I think we've seen some of the twist filters, but I don't know if they had capsules. So again, I'm going to I'm going to scour our packs today and try to find those for you. Um, and I don't know whether they were the big brands or smaller brands, but but we'll see. And I'm 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 relying on my memory, and I'm I'm getting older. Um, so okay, I, I have a couple of questions that I would love for you to answer, and then I'll, I'll get to uh, the the one in the Q and A chat um, and see if there are any more. So I, I wondered if, and I don't know if you get a lot of these questions once you open the industry documents. It's like, did it say this also? Did it say this also? Um, so like concept flavors that are attached to some of these capsules, right? The, the things like Ibiza Sunset or, or Tokyo Midnight, um, like this, are they trying to distance themselves from like real characterizing flavors that we sort of know 
Um, was there anything in the documents about that? And then also, I guess if there's anything like forward looking, are you are you looking at the the patents um, and and trying to say like, you know, this what this also wasn't successful in the past, but it could be something that's going to pop up in the near future. Is there any of that in the patent work? So I'll let you answer those two. Yeah, yeah. So regarding this uh, different themes, marketing themes. Yeah, I mean, it seems based on the industry documents that we found that they were really just looking at different ways in which they could make it appealing uh, to young people, you know? So, I mean, I know that but when, you, when you mentioned some of these exotic sounding names, they were looking into, um, you know, flavors for capsules that could appeal to like culturally specific taste profiles. Yeah. Because they also recognize that this millennial generation is very ethnically diverse. You know, and they actually embrace exploring different cultures as well. So they wanted to, you know, try and look at different exotic flavors and mixes that they, yeah. So that was definitely a theme in the advertising. And regarding looking out for patents, yeah, I mean, this is one reason why we, we looked at patents and especially those filed in the past 10 years. You know, we, we do see quite a few different design features that to our knowledge have not been brought to the market yet. I mean, it's very interesting if those transparent filters do exist because we, we searched and we didn't find any evidence of them, but that would be very interesting. And certainly uh, for some of the other designs as well, I mean, you know, like, as I mentioned, the score G project was shelved, uh, you know, for this harm reductive cigarette, or at least it could be marketed as a harm reductive cigarette. And uh, that project was abandoned, but it's possible that, you know, they may revive it later down the line. Um, or that maybe, you know, at the time, it's just that the design wasn't right or, you know, the demand wasn't there and that they're just waiting for it. And it seems like that's definitely happened with the mainstream capsule cigarettes, too, because there were clearly developments in the 60s and again in the 80s to develop them and bring them to market, but it just didn't take off. And it seems like perhaps they're waiting for the right opportunity, which, you know, in this case was the millennial generation in the 2000s. That's good. Um, like, I'll mention one thing about one of our, our questions here and make a comment. Like, looking at patents, looking at industry documents is really important to stay ahead of the industry. It's also really important to give our policymakers a heads up of like, how can they avoid these types of things and, and avoid loopholes. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely think the Ibiza sunset in Tokyo midnight fall right into that millennial sort of adventurous and, and sort of this idea of choice and I don't, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so one of the questions in our Q&A uh, by Dr. Megan Moran, um, curious about the seed and spread approach. I guess that's like the use of influencers and, and retailers. And I think this is a million dollar question. H how can we <laughs> monitor this and how could it be regulated? Oh, that's a difficult one. I mean, back then, this was 2000s from when this launched, you know, so chances are their specific tactics were different uh, because social media has changed a lot since, say, the mid 2000s. And I mean, now, I mean, we see this again, you know, uh, cigarettes and e-cigarettes alike, you know, we see a lot of it being marketed on social media, channels like Instagram and whatnot, TikTok. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, it's a case of really, I think, yeah, restricting the advertising there, raising awareness to this younger generation that they're actually being targeted with adverts, you know, cigarette adverts. And I think, yeah, one big challenge is just that it's cross-border, right? It's very hard to regulate, um, yeah. <laughs> Certainly so. Um, another question about the, the patent searches. Um, obviously, this is very difficult to do patent searches. Um, this is an amazing work from uh, our, our colleague, Dr. Ryan Kennedy. Um, and he was curious about the patent holders. Um, anyone apart from the tobacco industry? Were, were there paper companies or chemical companies, anything like that that you saw? Yeah, so actually a vast majority were from transnational tobacco companies. There were a couple here and there, but we excluded them because we were looking mainly at the transnational tobacco industry strategies, right? Um, I mean, we did come across a couple from, I believe it was a company that's looking more at marijuana. So the product that we found, it was like a patent, which I think was designed more for marijuana products, but could also be used for cigarettes. Um, then there was a few which we excluded because they were not in English or there was no English translation available. Um, like they were in Chinese. So I think that was, this was more from the, the Chinese tobacco industry or Chinese National Tobacco Corp or whoever was working for them. Yeah. But fortunately, we were really unable to analyze them because, you know, they were in Chinese characters um, or Korean. Okay. Um, 
I mean, like I have a few other questions. I I, I think we're running short on time. I'll, I'll try to pick just one. Um, I guess one of the things like, you know, having flavors is one thing and, and flavor capsules really allow so many different brand variants uh, because you can have combinations of, you know, two, three, four capsules in a, in a single pack and different combinations of flavors that you just get so many different types of, of variants within a brand. Was it like, do you, do you have any idea whether this, and then maybe again from industry documents, was this a, an intentional tactic or an intentional thing? Did they realize that this could really help them, I guess, create market share by having so many variants of, of capsules? I think so. I mean, you know, I guess the point is that they want to try and appeal to people as much as possible, right? So, and, and also knowing that this is a diverse group of people that they're targeting who maybe have diverse taste profiles and they want to have that ability to personalize. So yeah, the more kind of features that they could develop, I guess, the better. And then it's just a case of testing them on consumers, see what works and what does not. Yeah. I mean, before your talk, I was really like, you know, it was very interesting where you're saying that capsules could be a, a sort of a loophole in a, in a flavor ban. And at first, you know, at glance, you say, well, it's a flavor capsule. So obviously they, they would be included in a flavor ban, but the patents that you showed at the end are so clear that they could have these like at loose capsules that they're going to create. And then these recessed filters that allow for loose capsules and cigarette smokers could then do their own aftermarket capsule cigarettes, right? And that it's important to see that kind of stuff and know and tip off policymakers that you need to be also thinking about loose capsules and how that could actually play a role even when you have a flavor ban, right? I guess we see it a lot with yeah. e-cigarettes as well, right? If you remove flavors, but you also sell aftermarket just flavored liquid, the, the consumer can then again do it on their own. So there's a lot of, you know, uh, the liability issues of, of people handling this uh, themselves is also a, a big issue here. So I think it's, this is great work and it really is tough to do patents and, and document review and all that stuff. So very difficult, but worth doing. Um, I see we're at time and I wanna be respectful to everybody's time. I wanna thank uh, for sharing everything you did today with us um, and thanks for your work in tobacco control. And I wanna thank everyone who joined us today. So uh, we'll leave it there. Thanks and uh, we'll see you guys at the next uh, lecture series lecture. Thank you. <laughs>